sitting here today with Walter L. Davidson. The L stands for Lincoln. Uh, Walter was kind enough. Uh, we have a common uh, friend in the VA. We won't mention names because I, I'm here unofficially. And thank you, Walter, for having me. Uh, Walter Davidson is a World War II vet and uh, was kind enough to invite me into his home. And we're sitting here today. And we're just going to have a conversation and, and talk about whatever comes up, but there's a few certain topics, obviously, the, the VA and your time in the service. But, um, Walter, why don't you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself, and, and, and thank you for being here today. Well, I'm Walter L. Davidson. The Walter L. The L stands for Lincoln. That goes back a long time. My father was born in 1860, right at the time Lincoln came into power. Well, some 25 or 30 years, I don't know just how many, maybe 40 years even. Before that, my grandfather was a friend of Lincoln's, and he knew Lincoln when they were young men. Really? And uh, Lincoln was working in a grocery store, and my father, his two brothers used to hang around there. Not my father, excuse me, my grandfather. And these two brothers used to hang around there. They knew him real well. In fact, I had a letter written by a great great niece or something, I believe it was, of one of his brothers to to a stepsister I had in in uh, Washington State. And he was telling how he was he was a pretty big man. He was six foot six, and how he used to toss Lincoln up in the air. And when Lincoln would come down, he'd ask him how the weather was up there. <laughs> <laughs> when Lincoln worked at a grocery store to make a little extra money, why, he uh, would pull teeth. He set up a chair outside of the grocery store where, where people would come in, and if they needed somebody had a toothache, they didn't no dentist to fill a teeth of those days. They didn't fill teeth, didn't do root canals or nothing. They just simply pulled them. Abraham Lincoln pulled teeth. Yes. <laughs> uh, that was probably probably in his early 20s, maybe not even 20. I'm not too sure about the age. But anyhow, as a result, he had difficulty pulling them, so he had the local spitty make him a pair of forceps. They're pretty crude looking, look like a little, little pair of pliers. And that's what he used. When he uh, gave up pulling teeth and decided to go a different route, he went one direction. My great grandfather went another way. They separated, but when he gave up there, well, he gave my grandfather those little forceps, and they have passed down from him to his father, which happened to be, I mean, his son, I mean, excuse me, my father, and uh, on down to me, and I had, I now have them. They're in a safe deposit box in a bank. Oh, good. Uh, I have no proof that he did them or anything else. I'm not looking for any proof. It don't make any difference to me. I'm not selling them or anything anyhow. I've um, got a little discrepancy where they're going to go from now, but that's that's another story. Right. The, but that's where the L comes from. When my father was born in 1860, well, he named him Walter Lincoln, and I, I'm, I'm Walter Lincoln. My son's Walter Lincoln. Very nice. That's uh, I never knew that about Abraham Lincoln. Thank you for telling me that. That was... Uh Never, I mean, I knew some things about his young age, but never heard that story at all. Uh, where did you, uh, where were you born and where did you grow up, Walter? Well, I grew up in the South Pacific. <laughs> I went down there at the age of six, uh, 20, going on about 16, maybe 14. I was born in western Nebraska at a very remote ranch. Uh, I never saw another kid my age till I was about six years old. And I grew up with a bunch of cowboys, ranch hands. I never had no toys. I didn't even know what toys was. I didn't. Uh, I didn't grow up as a child at all. I grew up as an adult. Sure. My English was adult. Uh, my learning. I must have been about five years old. In those days, they called the comics. We got a newspaper by mail, weekly newspaper in Nebraska. I would notice those comics, and they, they called them the funny papers. I'd notice the funny papers, had little blurbs after the pictures. 
I asked my mother, what's that? What is that? Well, that's what they're saying. I said, well, how do you know it? She said, well, I read it. I said, well, how do, how do you learn to read it? Well, she said, you want me to learn you? I said, sure. So I learned how to read from the comic papers, believe it or not. Well, I noticed when she would write to her sisters, she had a couple of sisters, it didn't look like that at all. It looked different. So I said, well, hey, what's this? And she said, well, that's writing. Said, what's in the papers there? That's printing. Well, teach me to write. I, I want to learn how to write. Well, she taught me how to write my name. I, I wasn't real good at it, but I got it. And pretty soon she started to tell me after I learned how to do several different words, I could put two words together and three or four words together and make a sentence. Then she taught me, she said, you got to learn your numbers. I didn't know what learning my numbers meant, but that's what they called arithmetic nowadays. So I found out if I had an apple and she gave me another one, then I had two. <laughs> if I dropped one and lost it, I was back to one again. That was a subtraction. And if I had three times as many apples as I had, that was a multiplication. I learned that. So well, but my dad couldn't go to school. There was no school close by at all. But when I was seven years old, the man that owned that ranch that my father was a ranch foreman on sold it. The new owner was in Nebraska. The owner, of, when my dad worked there, was in Colorado. And that rancher wanted my dad to stay, but my dad had his own ideas. That was the third ranch he had been a ranch foreman on and been very successful. He had his eye on a little ranch, a little, little place in Colorado. Oh, it was a little place that was a long way from anywhere else, too. But anyhow, he figured he would get there and uh, start his own ranch. And he was bound and determined that's what he was going to do. He had done many things. He had been in a lot of things. To begin with, my father was 62 years old when I was born. Oh. My father was 39, 59. My mother was 39 when they were married. Okay. I was born three years later. Anyhow, we went to Colorado in a wagon. I remember it took six days to make it. We didn't even have a cover on it. It wasn't even a covered wagon. I remember how many cars. I'd very seldom ever seen cars. How many were broke down along the road? Well, I found out later they weren't really broke down. The tires, tires give out. They were jacked up. They'd have to take the tire off, put a patch on it. Then everybody would take their turn at the pump, get the pump back up again, then put it back on to change the tire, it took an hour, an hour and a half. Oh. <laughs> and uh, everybody had to work on it to get it going. So as we'd go by them, I always remember my dad would holler up, hey, get a horse. <laughs> Six days later, we arrived in Colorado. Oh, what a remote place that was. That was worse than Nebraska. I saw lots of people in Nebraska. Lots of we had quite a ranch hands there. Uh, neighbors were not really very close. So you see them once in a great while. That was actually, Nebraska was kind of a combination farm and a ranch and farm. But anyhow, we got there to Colorado and we were doing pretty good. No school, no school close enough for me to go. Have to take me in a wagon, but a horse and buggy. And uh, there was a two room school about, uh, I think it was about 10 miles away. Well, after a year, there was a, our closest neighbor. He was uh, three, somewhere around three quarters to a mile away. He was living there with his sister. She had two children. I guess she was divorced, had two children, and had a girl a little bit older, me and a boy. Oh, he was four or five years younger. He wasn't school age. Anyhow, he talked to the school board. I don't remember what he had, some old car that he would buy a newer car and run a school bus if they would pay him so much for each one of us. It was five of us. They were the only ones I knew. I knew of one other boy. I knew of him, and I had seen him a couple of times. He was older than me. I don't know, three or four years older than me. And there was two other ones I didn't even know. But he would run us to school every day, and so the school board finally went for it. 
and I was all excited about getting to go to school. I was almost nine years old. My mother was telling me how there was a bunch of kids there and how I would have a lot of fun and everything well. Got there and the teacher started explaining things. It was a two-room school, four grades in each room. And she right. said, this, this row here is for first grade, this row is second grade. I think it was 15 of us in four grades. That four grades, total of 15 people in the first eight. And I don't remember what there was in the second, uh, the, from the fourth, from the fifth, to the eighth. I can't remember. Yes, sir. But anyhow, teacher says, okay, take your seats. You know where you belong. I thought things over. I thought, well, I probably belonged in the fourth grade. But they talked about arithmetic. I heard those kids talking about arithmetic, and I didn't know what arithmetic was. I didn't know that was your numbers. So anyhow, as a result, I parked. I thought, well, I'll take a third grade for a couple of weeks. If I've not learned anything, I'll move over to the fourth. So I parked in the third grade. The teacher looked at me, Walter, get out of there. You don't belong there. Get over where you belong. I said, well, teacher, I thought maybe I belonged over there, but I wasn't sure. So I'll go ahead and try it. So I moved over in the fourth grade. Well, that did it, boy. She lit into me and in certain terms. You've got to be in the first grade. Well, teacher, I can't learn nothing over there. I, I, them kids can't even read or write. They don't know the, the anything. They don't know their numbers. They don't know nothing. How am I going to learn anything? Well, she said, you've got to spend a year there, a year in the second grade. So I had to go in the first grade for a year. I learned nothing. Oh, boy. All the way through elementary school, I didn't learn anything. After I was in the fourth grade, when I was in the fourth grade, we, well, to begin with, what happened? Let me go back just a little bit. Yes, sir. My father was doing very good. He had little money in the bank, not anything to brag about. He had some money. He was getting loans on whatever he needed. He had no trouble getting a loan, no trouble making the payments, no trouble at all. He he built us a house, very unique house. I could go into that, but uh, it's not all that important. <laughs> okay. Anyhow, when the market crashed in 1929, we lost everything we had. We weren't alone. Oh, boy. There was a good many... Most all of our neighbors did. Right. A few. Some of them did not believe in banks, did put, not put any money in the banks. They were the ones that survived good hmm. or better. I can't say good, but better. Right. Air prices all went down, of course, everything. And, boy, we were just absolutely forced into leaving. We moved into a small town. We didn't actually move into the town. We was a mile away. We got a place for, I don't know, I think it was 6 or $7 a month. And we moved in there. It was a mile from school. I had to walk down a railroad track to get to school. And I got there, and I did not get along very good there in school, for starters, at all. And why was that, you think? Well, the reason was I wasn't learning anything. Oh. For right. starters, on top of that, I was probably the poorest of poor kids there. We was all poor. Finally, one day, one of the boys, he was not very well liked. There was a whole family of them. They, they were not very well liked. Their father worked in an oil field. There was five boys and two girls. They were not liked at all. This one boy was about two years younger than me. He was bigger than I was. He stepped up in the crowd, and he said, Listen, you guys... If I hear one more person calling this kid here the poor that poor kid, he said, I'm gonna personally beat the devil out of you. And he said, If I can't do it and you uh, you younger people of my age want to come in and get the devil beat out of you and then you sick your big brother after me, I've got three bigger brothers and he said they'll be right on all of you. And if you don't like that, put your dad in and my dad can whip them all. So after that I was treated pretty darn good. But I did learn nothing. I got out of the eighth grade when I was 16 years old. And I thought, I'm not learning nothing. And believe it or not, it was, uh, it was uh, five, six years after that, more than that, I guess, 
16, 20, 45 years, seven years, I guess, or nine years after that, before it paid off what my knowledge was. And I'll go into that a little later. Anyhow, I worked a variety of anything. Well, to begin with, my father passed away when I was 13 years old. Okay. My mother got his wallet. See what was in it. One silver dollar. That's all we had. Hmm. And I tell you, I had nothing. Today, anybody that wants to come to my home and look around, they'll find two cars in the driveway. They'll find a motor home in the backyard. They'll find a house that's completely paid for, been paid for for over 20 years. Everything I own is paid for today. So I've been progressed very much from what I was when I got out of the Navy. When yes, I got sir. out of the Navy, I could carry every single thing I owned on my back. Everything that was mine, I could carry on my back. Right. Anyhow, as a result, uh, I went to work. I worked whatever things I could find to do. The average pay that time, that year, that time, working in the fields was a dollar a day. I used to pick like top beats, I thin beats, I weeded beets, I did everything. I, I picked pickles, I did anything I could. Summertime, I'd go out and pick cherries and uh, to make some money so we could survive on. Then the CCCs come into existence. I was, I was 1939, I was 17 years old. I joined the CCCs. What was the CCCs? Where were they? Yes, what were they, sir? Oh, that was Civilian Conservation Corps. Okay. That was uh, Roosevelt put that in with the WPA. And uh, what was the WPA? That was Workers, uh, let's see, uh, Workers Project uh, Association or something like that. Okay. And that's uh, that, oh, that was famous back in those days. A lot of buildings you see today were built by the WPA. Okay. Uh, the trails of the National Park Service. A lot of those were put in. A lot of them were put in by the CCCs. Well, I, I spent six months in the CCCs. I had a stepbrother in Washington State. Not a stepbrother, excuse me, a half-brother. Same father. He told me I could come out there and I could make a dollar an hour. That was eight times the amount of money I was making. Right. I didn't have money enough to go to Washington, so he sent me the money. I went out there and I worked six months. Six months out there. I knew right then, when I started, very shortly after I started working in Washington State, that there was a war coming. I knew that. Okay. I saw right away what they were doing. They were There was a FBI on jobs. They were checking you. God, I remember they looked at me and said, you're just a kid. What are you doing here? You should be in school. I said, yeah, I, I would be if I had the money. Well, I checked out all right with them, so that was all right with them. They didn't care. Anyhow, after six months there, one day he had a, a three and a half, four, four year, three and a half year old, I guess she was, daughter. Never did care for his wife. I just didn't care for her. I'd never seen her, of course, before. I had never seen him before. He treated me just fine. Good. Anyhow, that little girl says to me, my mommy don't like you. She says, you ought to go back where you come from. Well, I'll tell you, the next day I was headed back where I come from. I had a pretty good bankroll. I thought I was wealthy, practically, as far as I was concerned. Sure. So I went home. I had a job waiting me for that summer. I had a job cowboying, guiding tours on horseback in Rocky Mountain National Park. Really? I, I was 17 years old. I worked two months. June and July, very early August, one day the rangers caught up me out on the trail. Rangers started, I had four or five people on a tour. And he says, how old are you? I said, 17. 17? You can't guide tours. <laughs> well, I said, I've been doing it all summer. I have no trouble. Well, he said, you can't do it anymore. You've got to be 21. I said, 21? Yeah, he said, you can't guide tours. I went back and told my boss, happened to be about five years older than me. He was the guy that owns the whole thing's brother. He didn't have a license either. 
Well, there was a girl who lived about four miles away, and about every day that summer she would hop on her pony and ride up. There was a girl across the street her age at a chalet. It was Estes Park Chalets, Deer Ridge Chalet, excuse me. Deer Ridge Chalets, Deer Ridge Junction. And uh, her father was a ranger, old time ranger, been there for years. She knew all the answers. God, she was a rodeo queen, she was a ski queen. She was everything, prom queen, school, very well-liked girl. She told me, she says, listen, she says, I'll tell you what to do. I'll tell you who to go see. You go downtown, you go see Judge Hackett. She says, Judge Hackett runs the whole show. He can do whatever he wants. She says, I'll tell you, he ain't going to want to talk to you at first. But she says, you keep pestering him, he'll talk to you. Well, I went down and told him what my story was. He said, yeah, you, you can't do nothing. I went down and saw him. Oh, no, no. He said, you've got to be 21 years old. He says, son, you come back in about four years, and I'll give you a <laughs> license if you, don't want to, if you can pass the test. I says, I don't want to come back in four years. I want to come back in about four days and get a license. You know, you can't go and get no license in four days. So I rode back up home. I had nine miles. It was nine miles by the road. I took a shortcut. I could make it about six. About an hour and right. a half down there, an hour and a half back, I had to. I went back and told her, you go back again. You, you pester him. He'll, he'll, be, he'll come around. I went back. She said, I told you I can't do nothing. I said, sure you can. I said, I, I need to work. I said, I know that park inside out. You do? I said, I think I do. I said, I'll, I'll go up against any of your guides. I said, any of the guides you got in there? I said, I'll answer every question they can. Oh, he said, you're just talking. You can't do that. I said, sure I can. Well, let me think about it. Well, sure enough, she sent me back again. As a result, I went back about four days later. It was already about 10th or something of uh, August. I'd been doing a little bit of guy to get a hell of where the rangers weren't at, getting by with it. I went back down and he said, you seem awful determined. I said, I am. He said, you, you claim you know this park pretty good. I said, I think I do. He said, well, I'm gonna give you a little test just to see what you know. He said, this is all unofficial, but I gotta know a little bit about it. So he started asking me questions. Well, I fired back the answers to him. The park was 405 square miles, had 13 peaks over 13,000 feet. One of them, Long's Peak, was over 14,000. It was 14,255. I started aiming off the tops of Black, uh, uh, Flat Top, and Taylor Peak, and Ypsilon. He said, boy, you, you must read a lot. I said, I read everything I can get my hands on. He said, well, i got to think about this. Come back a couple of days, see what I can do. Okay. So I went back in a couple of days and told him, you again? I said, yeah, you didn't give up. I said, no. So he reaches over where the licenses were, picked up one of those licenses that said, uh, uh, certified guide for Rocky Mountain National Park horse, horseback tours. He put it in the typewriter, and just the top of it, the capital letters, he put junior. He put junior, uh, underlined it, junior guide. He handed it back to me, he said, now you're a junior guide. You can guide towards anybody that anybody said anybody else can. The only restriction you can't do is they can. You can't run any overnight tours on your own. He said, that's the only restriction. Well, I hadn't been running. I run two or three fishing tours is all I had ever run overnight. And he so so, so that as a result I became the yellowest person to ever get a license there. There was only two of those issued and during the war there was some kid down at uh, uh Fall River Ranch. He was twenty years old, he was a four F. Uh not not qualified for military service. Right. He also got one at the nineteen forty seven after the war was over and I was back doing that again, they eliminated it and I fought like heck to keep them that. I think it should have been an effect, but they, nobody had to have license after that. So mm -hmm. as a result, 
I held one of the only two licenses ever issued to guide, guide tours at Rocky Mountain National Park. You had a no, whole nother position created for you. Yep. That's true. Good. So as a result, I did whatever I could there. Uh, before the war, when the war come along, I had a friend of mine. Well, I was out digging pipeline. It was on Sunday. I'd undertaken to take up a bunch of pipeline. We got paid by the by the foot by the foot. Well, it was supposed to be about 18 inches deep. We got into some stuff there that was four feet deep. I said, "Oh, brother, we can't make no, we can't even make a dollar a day here, which is the going wages." And so they decided to pay us by the hour on digging that up. I was working on that. I didn't even know the war was on. I got home and a friend of mine came over to tell me about it. Well, I started thinking about it. I worked that summer as a cowboy. I was 19 years old. I was 20 years old, 29th of August, 1942. And uh, I had to sign up for the draft. I went, signed, went down signed up on the third day of September. And uh, four days later on the 7th, I joined the Navy. I uh, had a friend of mine call me up, tried to talk me into it. I didn't want to join with him. I finally said, decided I would. I called another guy. No, he didn't want to join. So I went down to join the Navy. Well, those days, it wasn't easy to get in. I went where they did. And they said, no, we can't let you in. Quote us full. He made a couple phone calls. And finally found a town about 30 miles away. He said, they've got an opening of two down there. You want to run down there and join? I said, okay. He told him, yeah, I got a man for you. Hold it for him. Well, he says, I will unless a couple, two guys come in here. One, there's two openings. He said, I'm going to let them have it. Have to wait till later. I went down. Nobody had been in. I joined up. There was five of us. But two uh, joined two other guys. We went to Denver. Took our physicals. Everything, a lot of questions asked and all that. Well, us three guys all made it, and so did two more. But it was five of us out of ten. I'll never forget one guy says, hey, he didn't make it. What about us? The guy said, the Army's right around the corner. They'll take anything. Go over there. <laughs> so anyhow, I was in the first company to get out of Farragut, Idaho. I, I'd never heard of Farragut, Idaho. Navy boot camp, very good Idaho. Well, uh, Walter, I'm going to stop you for just a second. I, I'm picking up a theme here. That you're a guy that didn't like to hear a no, and that you, uh, not that you didn't like to hear a no, but you didn't like to be told you couldn't do something, and you were determined to make it happen, and that's uh, admirable, sir. That's right. You. Uh, I'm a very determined person. I don't know the word can't. Excellent. Excellent. That is uh, very evident and uh, not, it's been very enjoyable hearing just the early part of your life. And uh, that was obviously a, a, a theme early on. Uh, you had a thirst for learning. You had a thirst for knowing and, and, and making your own way. And, and Well, in just recent years, I joined the Lions. Lions Club in 1970. Have no idea I was going to stay. I'd put on a program. My son and I put on a program for him one week. The next week they invited me back. I couldn't make it. I was working. Next next week on, come back for me again. I was available. So I went. Have no idea what was in store. I got there. Got a shock of my life. I was being sworn in as a new lion. <laughs> well, I thought, oh, what the heck. Good bunch of guys. I know most of them. Sure. I'll stay for three or four years, see what I think of it. That was in 1970. I just got my 48th year in this year. It'll be 48 years on the 4th of October that I've been a lion. I got my 48-year pin bid already. So. Very nice, sir. Very nice. But we had a secretary at our club. Every time something come up, oh, we can't do that. We can't do it. I said, Barbara, I says, 
I don't know the word can't. I said, we'll do it. Well, I got in a lot of trouble there. I had a lot of opposition, a lot of older people, but I hung that club together for 30 years. Good for you. And I finally just gave up, posed it up, joined another club. Well, I'm a lifetime lion. I became a lifetime lion in 1993. Lifetime lion don't pay no dues. Okay. You got in there for his life. Well, I went to this club and they wanted to charge me a cl club dues. <laughs> so I called International, Lions International. And on their advice, don't join that club, don't pay them anything. He said, just tell them that you're not going to join. He said, some club will pick you up that really appreciate you for the for the, for the the information and uh, you'll be an officer in it. Well, I called up the main guy there. I'd known him since 1987. I said, Richard, I don't want to shock you, but I'm going to make an announcement tonight. I'm not joining your club. Oh, don't do that. Don't do that. Why not? Oh, I said, Richard, you guys are trying to charge me about, oh, I don't remember what it was. It was, uh, I think the full dues was something like $60. I was going to have to pay $30 every six months. Hmm. And uh, I said, I'm, I'm not going to pay it. I said, uh, I've been advised by Lions International what to do, and that's what I'm doing. Don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. I said, I'll be there tonight, and I'll make the announcement. I got there. He was watching for me come in the door. Boy, he got there. We had to, we had to check in. We got our food, then we went into the meetings. Well, we ate first into the meetings. Well, don't make no announcement, don't make no announcement. I'll do all talking, I'll do all talking. I said, all right, just do me that favor, do me that favor. So I got in there and he, he said he wanted to announce it. So I was joined the club at no, no club, no club expenses whatsoever. So I did join it, I'm still in it, I'm very active. I just got my 48 European here. Uh, but I got it. Uh, July 16th. Congratulations, sir. So uh, that's 48 years in Lions. I, I'm a full-time member. I had 43 years, 43 years of Lions of perfect attendance. After 43 years, I just, um, I, a bunch of things were entered to me here, mainly uh, vision. I right. Dr I drove for 74 years. At 90, I was driven since I was 16 to when I was 90. My vision was very, very bad. It's still bad. Right. In fact, I'm come to this time last year, I was virtually everything but blind. I've had two operations on each eye, two cataracts taken off, the two I led this put in. My vision is much better. I'm having trouble with one eye and Great trouble, still working on it. Hoping, hopefully, glasses are going to help now. Okay, but that's uh, that's a little bit of my early life. On the, on the lines, yeah. let's uh, let's uh, let's talk about you're in the Navy. You had just joined, and uh, you okay. got in, which was hard to get in. You said, and uh, well, I got in, and I was in Company Four Forty Two in Farragut, Idaho. Okay, I was uh, got out of there. In six weeks, and uh, oh, when I got out of the Navy, they started asking questions. What did you What did you do in civilian life? Well, these two guys I joined with, one of them's father owned a grocery store. He said he worked in the store. He said, "Okay, we're going to send you to storekeeper school." The other boy, he he said uh, the younger one of the two, he said, "Well, my dad had a restaurant." Really was the restaurant. It was kind of a honky tonk. They did serve food. They served food, beer, wine, no hard liquor. Okay. Anyhow, he said, I worked at the restaurant. I did everything. I did everything bus tables, wait on people, help cook. Well, we're going to send you to go store, keep a school too. Those two guys never went outside the United States during the war. Hmm. Got to be. Well, I guess you can say, I'm a cowboy. I says, well, he said, we don't have any of those jobs here. I said, well, get me a left arm rating. My brother had told me, my half-brother had told me, get a left arm rating, you'd be below deck. I said, all I want to make sure I get left arm rating. He said, okay, let's see what we got open. He said, well, he said, the only left arm rating is we got some machinist bait and a pharmacist bait. 
Well, I guess I have to stop you for a second, Walter. What's a left arm rating? Well, you, you wear your rating on the left arm. Okay. You know, you see guys with stripes on it. Well, most of uh, I don't know about the Army, and I don't I know a little bit about the Marines. Okay. Uh, but not, uh, I know a lot about the Marines, but as far as the ratings goes, I believe the ratings are all on the same arm. I'm not sure. Okay. I think they're on the left arm. Anyhow, he says, okay, let's see what we got. And he come back and he said, uh, machinist mate and pharmacist mate. I said, well, I think, what's a machinist mate do? I said, I kind of interested in that. He said, well, he said, you'll learn to work on motors and everything. I said, give me a chance to that. He said, okay, let me see if I got an opening in it. He come back, no, no openings in there. He says, the only choice you got a left arm rating is pharmacist mate. Well, I didn't realize at the time. I asked what a pharmacist mate was. Work at a pharmacy? And he said, no. He said, you're a, you're called a corpsman. You, you'll do a little bit of everything, he says. He said, it's interesting. It's faster. He says, it's a fast way of rate, getting uh, moving up grades, too. He didn't tell me the reason it was fast. The reason it was fast is there's no medical department in the Navy. I mean, the Navy is but not in the Marine Corps, the CVs, or the SEALs. The Navy furnishes all of them. Everybody that you see, it says with the, any medical department you see of the SEALs, mm -hmm. the CVs, or the, uh, well, so whatever it well, was. Marine but, Corps, right? Yeah, Marine Corps is all Navy. And I said, oh, well, I didn't know that, see. I said, okay, I'll take it. Well, I really lucked out. I got sent to core school, got out of core school, San Diego, the seventy to Jacksonville, Florida. I was at the Jacksonville Naval Hospital. Boy, I got a real good start. Two little nurses in there from uh, uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana. They've been together since childhood. And uh, one of those grabbed my hand about the second or third day. She said, Davidson? She says, come back here with me. I want to teach you something. She says, let those stupid ones dump the bed pads. She says, I want to teach you something. She taught me how to autoclave stuff, how to sharpen needles. She didn't throw nothing away in those days. You sharpen the needles, and you autoclave the syringes. Everything was used over again. Right. And uh, three months there, bingo. I get orders to Paris Island, South Carolina. That was a that was a Marine Corps recruit station. Oh, brother, I went up there. I give ten thousand shots while I was there. And I saw those Marines. Oh man, they got training that made ours look kind of sick. I thought I thought that was tough. I found out later it wasn't tough at all. Sure. I was there. there oh, what five months? I guess I worked at that Marine Corps base, and I got orders to. Go to New River, North Carolina. They were forming the new, new Marine, uh, Fifth Raider Battalion. Boy, the Raiders were the big deal those days. There was Ethan's Raiders, Carlson's Raiders, and all the Raiders. But boy, it was like a death warrant. They had about fifty percent casualties. Oh boy! And uh, that was an all volunteer outfit for the Marines, but the Navy got assigned to it. Twelve weeks of training. Oh, brother, I ran into a little Frenchman in, in uh, Jacksonville, uh, Frenchy LePage. He was a little guy, solid muscles. He was Canadian. He come down from Canada. He was an orphan boy. Come down, joined the U.S. Navy. And him and I become pretty good friends. Remained friends for, oh, until 1995, I guess it was, yeah. I, he moved to Tucson, Arizona, and I had seen him a couple times in in Massachusetts. I'd, but I got married. My wife was from Rhode Island. Stopped there and seen Frenchy a couple of times. He had a couple. He went ahead and became a doctor. Had a couple of offices. He was a chiropodist, is what he was. Later changed to the word podiatrist. Okay. But in hell, I the only way you could get out of that was flunk out. Oh, man, that was tough. They'd run you out 3 o'clock in the morning, take a 17-mile hike, get back in time for breakfast, get back in time to do your exercise before you went to breakfast after hiking 17 miles. Ooh. 
combat pack. God, I thought that was tough. The only way you could get out of there was plunk out. You could just uh, tell them you physically couldn't stand it and send you to the doctor if he thought that you was right. Well, you get out. Hmm. I I had no doctors. Worked on my own with with a couple of other corpsmen. I told Frenchie, he said, hey, you always call me Dave. Dave, you're just as tough as anybody. Yeah, you're as tough as any of these breeds. I'm as tough as they are, too. We can make it. We can make it. So I stayed with it. Well, they said, if you think this first 10 weeks is rough, wait till you see the last two. Oh, we were all primed for something. Saturday, we weren't doing four hours at the most, usually about two hours on Saturday morning, and bingo, you off. Saturday morning, the DI came in at 6 o'clock. Hey, you guys, he said, you don't need to hurry about getting up today. No training at all. Stay in bed, get up, go on liberty, whatever you want to do. Be back 8 o'clock Sunday night. Well, I stayed in bed that morning. I thought about things. But got Sunday, Monday morning, came was all set for whatever this last two weeks was. Sure enough. Six o'clock, he comes in, he said, no training today. Everybody about fell on their face. We didn't know what the deal was. I didn't find out honestly what the deal was for oh, two months later on the Island of Guadalcanal before I found out what it was. What the deal was, he said, we're picking 10 of you Corbin to go through the Go to Norfolk, Virginia, go aboard ship, go down through the Panama Canal, come up the west side to San Diego and join the rest of us. We'll go over there overland. Well, I, did, I thought that was awfully funny to get Ted, Ted Corbin on that. Then I found out a little bit later there was a hundred Marines going with us. So we stood by on a four-hour basis for four days. Fourth day they come in, they said, well, you guys going through the Panama Canal, you're going to go overland instead. The ship's in dry dock in Norfolk. We don't know when it's going to be out. So we went overland to San Diego, trained just a little bit there. Every day we was there two weeks. We trained about two hours a day. Light training, very light for us guys, some marching. We went overseas. Oh, did I get seasick? Oh, my God. <laughs> I tell you. Sailed out of the harbor in San Diego. It was really smooth. Everything was fine. All of a sudden, ship made about two pitches, and I was throwing up everything I'd eat. I was sick 18 days to New Caledonia. Oh, boy. Went to New Caledonia. Spent about two weeks there. Beautiful place. Went up to Guadalcanal. That's where I realized what happened. This breaking us up. They, they said that's what they made the recon outfits out of the I did not know them, but they had also broke up the 4th Marines. The 4th Marines had got cleared to Guadalcanal as a group. We got we didn't get there as a group. I ended up with K Company, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, 1st Marine Division. Went up on the island of Pelilu, Pabubu. Oh, my God, what a place that was. Average rainfall was something like 69 inches a year. Oh, boy, the place was a swamp. It was uh, uh, muddy. Uh, there was, it was a coconut grove, big coconut grove. Rotten coconuts laying all around. We had to clean things up. We were, the main part of the first K Company was in Cape Gloucester. So and this is this is Pele, Pele Lu? No, this is Boo Boo. Oh, okay. And... Uh, Anyhow, we went there, we trained, the rest of the guys come down from New Britain, we did some training. Training was pretty light, really pretty light. Uh, but we trained there for until August. And I'll never forget, my birthday is August the 29th. This year I'm going to be 96. That year I was 22. I spent my 22nd birthday on on uh, Guadalcanal with a machete hacking my way through the jungles. Uh, where we, wherever we were going was supposed to be a heavy jungle, which it was. 
Uh, it didn't last that way long, very long. Navy just blasted that jungle all to pieces. But anyhow, we trained there a couple of days. When we got through training there, we all got, we got uh, four beers, six Cokes. That was the day, so the six ounce bottle of Coke. The beer was in bottles. It was a foster, it was about a 10 inch bottle, and a carton of cigarettes. Chesterfield handed out cigarettes down there by the case. I never smoked in my life, but I'd always take the cigarettes. They were worth more than money. I could trade it for a beer and Coke. Okay. I tucked all of that stuff in my old marine jacket and went up a cargo net about 30 feet up the side of a ship. Never broke a bottle. <laughs> I kid about that now. I can't even crawl out of bed. <laughs> then I could crawl clear up that cargo net. Well, we went aboard ship. They said, within two hours, we'll tell you where we're headed. That was the night of the 29th of August, evening of 29th of August. So we sailed out. Oh, 15, 20 minutes later, somebody had come up out of the hold. Hey, you guys, come down here in the hold. Come down here in the hold. There's a there's Tokyo Roses on the radio. The 11th Marines have got a radio. Went down there. I didn't know at the time, but I, it was an S-20R helicrafter, and I later bought one. Ain't a hell. Sure enough, here she was. She said, you bloody butchers of Guadalcanal. She says, you're going to Peleliud. You, we've got crack tubes here waiting for you. You've never tangled with anybody like them. That's true, but they would never tangled with anybody like the Marines either. <laughs> and she says, you won't be coming back. Just remember that. Well, that didn't sound too good, but anyhow, about an hour later or less than that, they made an official announcement, we're going to Peleliu. So she was talking specifically to you, and she knew before you did. She knew exactly where we were going. I don't know how, don't, uh, I had no idea. They wow. had a lot of inside stuff there had to be. Sure. A lot had to be. And I found out something else about that inside stuff I'll go into a little bit later. But anyhow, on the morning of, on the 14th of uh, September, that was 15 days to 16 days later, we sailed in. We couldn't see Pally Lou. We weren't close enough at night. Sailed in at night. Still stayed about five miles out. They thought five miles out, they couldn't reach us with their guns. And I guess they couldn't. Uh, we, we were backed up by the Idaho. I had never trained. Oh, yes, I didn't. I'd been aboard a aircraft. I'd, I'd trained on the old Higgins boats. Well, the Higgins boats was a disaster at Tarawa. Okay. They got hung up on the reef, so they decided to use uh, Amtrak uh, Ab tracks for all the first, oh, I don't know what first five lanes or whatever they were. I think it was 10 o'clock in the morning before they sent a boat into, well, into Peleliu. But I went in on an Amtrak we near the shore. Oh, my God, the Navy was fired right over the top of us. I'll tell you, those 14, 16, 18 inch guns fired. Looked like Volkswagen sailing through the air. <laughs> right over your head. My hearing today is completely shot. Sure. Completely shot. Anyhow, I was in World War II, and World War II don't, don't get much uh, favoritism from the VA. It's all, it's all, tar, it's all the uh, uh, Vietnam War. They, they're treated great. We're, we're, we're not treated decent at all. Right, right. Personally, and I've been treated fair at this hospital, pretty fair. But uh, as a whole, you just don't get what you got deserved. Right, and it's, uh, I went through a little of that with my dad and that he would apply for something on his own. Um, at first, he lived down in southern Arizona and worked through Tucson, and then when he came up here, we had problems with his records and, and everything else. But until I started working on his behalf uh, and started working with social workers and, and getting some declarations uh for him um that he was homebound and things like that it was very difficult for him to navigate especially on his own um a lot of denials a lot of uh things he had to work through to to get that care once we got to the doctor or the nurse they were pretty great overall but uh it was difficult to navigate the system well i've only considered 80 percent 
disabled. When I got out of the Navy, I was called in twice. Called in twice for physicals. They finally decided this was going to give me 10% for two chunks. I got two chunks of mortar shell to the right side of my chest. One very shallow, one about halfway through me. Hmm. And the left side, I got two in the back of my left knee, and I got a hole through my left side. Holy cow. And uh, I'm unable to walk. I've been unable to walk since uh, I, my old knees carried me to about 1980. Don't know until I was, uh, what was I? I was 94 years old, two years ago. My knees just gave out. I spent six weeks in rehabilitation, tried to learn how to use them, but I can't use them. Sure. Well, going into Pelly Lou, they said it was going to last two days, maybe three. So we didn't take no food, didn't need no food for two days. I found out different later, but take plenty of water. I took three canteens. I lost one on the landing. I uh, went over the side. Well, we were near the, sh near the shore, I think about 100, 100 yards out, something like that. I was standing up in that Amtrak. It was about 15 or 20 of us. And I gave. I said, boy, two days. I said, we'll all be back aboard ship tonight. I said, this thing, there's nobody alive on that island. Oh, the Navy was pounded. It was burning. Mm, right. Burning from end to end, just fire, you can see. You see smoke, God. I thought, there's nothing alive there. Boy, all of a sudden, I couldn't believe what happened. All of a sudden, all hell broke loose. Man, they laid out a barrage of fire at us, and it was great geysers of water, smoke going up. I mean, fire where they hit the water said geysers of water 30, 40, 50 feet in the air. All of a sudden, I thought uh, there was another Amtrak right on our starboard, about half a place behind us. He plowed in dust. I thought he got a hit. He didn't get hit, but he got a very near miss. Well, the two of them hit. Their tracks collided and killed the motors on both of them. Well, you're just a sitting duck if you're not moving, I'll tell you. We weren't moving very fast. I thought we were on the bottom, but we were. Captain says, over the side. So I went over the side in the water, all kinds of stuff in the water. You couldn't believe it. I took a look. The shore looked to be about, oh, no more than 75 yards, maybe not even that far ahead of me. So I headed in there. I got on that shore. I took off. I thought my whole company was in front of me. Is what I thought. I did not know there was nobody in front of me. I didn't find that out to three years ago before I found out. They asked me, I got a call from Lyons here. She says, uh, she had a couple of questions she wanted to ask me. I was coming up on 45 years. I was something about Lyons. She comes on, she says, are you a war hero? I said, no, what the devil are you asking me that for? <laughs> That's an unusual question to ask a lion. She says, I said, I'm no war hero. She said, well, maybe I got the wrong Walter L. Davidson. I said, well, you sure do. If you're looking for a war hero, I'm no war hero. So she says, uh, uh, do you know R.V. Bergen? I said, sure, he's a mortarman. She says, well, R.V. Bergen reported you were the first man to put foot on White Beach One on the landing of Pelly Lou. I said, no, I wasn't. I says, well, I guess maybe I was. I said, I thought my company was in front of me. If, if I was the first person, that was by accident. <laughs> and I found out that we were going into that shore. I was supposed to land on Orange Beach Three. Going, We were going in kind of not directly at it, but it's got a little hard to start going right toward it. We'd go to an angle. Well, that was about 150 yards to get into the beach. And, of course, when I'm out there in the water, I'm going to hit that beach as fast as way I could. Yes, sir. I says, what did what else did this, what did Bergen tell you? She said, I said, I knew if he answered one question, I'd know if he was there or not, because I didn't know anybody's behind me. Okay. And she says, well, she kind of laughed, and she said, well, she says, I'll tell you what he, uh, what he, uh, <laughs> what he uh, said. He said, you landed on the wrong beach. 
<laughs> well, I knew right then that that was right because I, d I didn't know he was behind me, but he was. I would hit there. I would hit for the bang. I would hit about 50, 75 yards. Jungle was all mangled up. See, we had to climb over a piece of it. I come to a real funny-looking ditch. i never seen anything like it. Go 15 or 20 yards one way, and then zigzag a little the other way. I jumped in that. Then the minute I got in there, I knew what it was. I'd heard of tank traps. So I worked my way up that tank trap. I was scared to death because I couldn't stick my head up front. The Japanese hit me, sticking up behind reeds and hit me. I'm going up there, and here comes around the corner another stupid Marine. Just didn't know any better than me. He jumped in there. And he, who are you? I was Doc Davidson. What, what outfit you in? I said, Headquarters Company, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marine. Hey, he said, you're in the wrong place. He said, this is the 7th Marines. I said, 7th Marines, what the devil are you doing here? He said, what are you doing over here? You're in the wrong island. You're in the wrong land, the wrong place. I was pretty wet. I said, I, I, said, I had to go over the side. I went the shortest way there was. So we worked our way up there together. Both of us probably equally scared. He heard somebody talking. He recognized the voice. He hollered out. I can't remember what his name was, but he hollered out. He said, stick your head up. Well, he said, I've got a Corbin here with me. Corbin? What's, which Corbin? Well, he's from the 5th Marine, from the, the, from the 3rd Battalion, 5th, yeah, 5th Marines. And I said, hey, you shouldn't be here. I said, I know I shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> so he stuck his head up. And said, Corbin, stick your head up. I did. Okay, come up out of there. So I did. I went back shore. I worked my way back to shore through the breeze. But we weren't getting hit too bad at all. Not too bad at all. I got back to shore. I was going to work my way down to my old outfit. Just about the time I got back there, there was a young Marine run, run up to me. Arm of bleeding, he didn't have no pack, he didn't have no weapon, he didn't have nothing to hold his left arm. Had a, a way up my shoulder. And I looked at him, he bleed like heck. I got the blood stopped. All he got a tank on him, his name, looking for somehow to get him out to a ship. Just about the a damn track come in unloaded. I hard as that driver, you going back to ship? He said, Yeah. I take this guy with you. I had his name tag on him. His name was Yates. He was 17 years old. Got a bullet clear through the arm. Didn't hit the bone. I said to him, in. figures that's the last time I'd see Yates. I'll tell you another story on that later. Okay. Anyhow, I worked my way down, got to my old outfit, and uh, we moved up to the airfield. We didn't. We didn't. We we camped there for the spent the night there. Uh, I don't know how many yards in it was to the beach. It wasn't very far. I'd say 500 yards, maybe at the most 300. Anyhow, we didn't even try to take it that day. Oh, we were mass confusion that night. Oh my God, our executive officer was a lieutenant colonel. I had met him. I knew his brother. His brother had taught school in my hometown in Colorado. I went to see him one time. That's another story. I later saw him 28 years later in Colorado, too. He was a full four-star general at that time. Mm -hmm. One of only two four-star generals in the Marine Corps. He was assistant commandant. And what, was it, what was his name again? What's it? What was his name again, oh, sir? Lou Walt. Okay. Lou Walt. He uh, passed away as a four-star general. Oh, God, I don't know. I think he was 69 or something, but I can't remember. Anyhow, if anybody ever deserved a Medal of Honor, it was Lou Wald, I'll tell you. He got everybody. He went with just nothing but a runner that night. He got everybody together, probably because of Lou Wald. And I had a great captain. His Nick, every, all the officers all used code names. He was ACAC. That ACAC reserve was given to him by a submarine on Guadalcanal. He was a second lieutenant. And they were being fired on, 
picked off one by one. They couldn't figure out how. No one couldn't see where the fire was coming from. They laid on their bellies, laying flat on the ground. Back I happened to notice that there was a three coconut trees up above them. He looked up there and he said, was a breeze next to him, had a bar, a BAR, Browning Automatic Rifle. He says, hey, give me your give me your weapon. They were a big weapon. They heavy. I don't know. I think it must have weighed 20 pounds. He braced himself, got that thing braced, and he sprayed those three trees with 15 shots. Nothing happened. Pretty quick, a body fell out of one of them. Then a body fell out of the other one. The body fell out of the third one. Somebody hollered at him, back act, that's the way to go. That day, back act stuck till the day he was killed, two days after me. Two days after I was wounded, Akak was killed. Got a bullet right between the eyes, and it was two, two hours before they were relieved of duty on oh, Guadalcanal, on Peleliu. But anyhow, he was a great captain, and, uh, but that, uh, but that next afternoon, early afternoon, we decided that we was gonna take the airfield about that time, the Japanese decided we weren't going to take it. They had, I, I think I heard later, it was 18 tanks. They rushed 18 tanks across that airfield office. It's going to shove us back into the ocean. Well, they massed their troops behind the tanks, massed them back of the tanks, and uh, here they came. Well, boy, the Marine pilots, Navy pilots off the ships, the Marines, they liked those Corvairs, Co Corsairs, mm -hmm. those Corsair gold wing planes. Right. Oh, did they have a picnic. Man, they strafed them up one side and down the other. I understood later they go, they lost 15 tanks. They got back three of their tanks is all they saved in that rush. Wow. But anyhow, we, we stayed there. After that, we rushed across that airfield made it clear to the far side of the ocean, far side of the island. It was only two miles. The thing was only two miles wide. Right. We got across there in a hurry that day after that deal. We got into the west coast. It's about dark. About eight, nine o'clock that night, everybody was so shot they hadn't slept much the first night. They said, well, 50% of you can sleep. Make sure you got somebody with you staying awake. Well, I got a little special favoritism there. I wasn't considered in that. I could sleep or I could stay awake, whichever one I wanted to. I just passed out Sure. that night. There was a corporal in, the, in our outfit. His name was, uh, oh, brother. Oh, man. Well, I, know he, I know he's... I know his cousin right now. His cousin's right here <laughs> in Arizona. Gotcha. Can I ask you a question? Sure. On, on, so Pele Lu, I want to make sure I say that right. And also, that was two miles wide. How long was it? It wasn't a very, it was a rocky island with an airstrip, right? That's right. And my understanding from reading is uh, Green down. The, the military was going with MacArthur's plan, and he had deemed it strategically important to have that airstrip for some attacks going on later on. Yeah, the, um, the landing in the Philippines. Correct. So the, but again, the uh, physical makeup of the island was, it was only two miles wide. It was very rocky. Uh, well, it was, it was coral. Coral, coral, very, yeah. uh, very coral. And um, that gave the Japanese a, uh, a they, ability to, to be down in caves they, and be down in they areas. They made their own caves. Right. They, uh, had miners come in from Japan and uh, build big rooms back in there. God, they had big spaces. So they 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 knew you were coming and and oh, they sure. kind of built that as a fortress, I, right. if That's you will. It. And right. how long was the island? You think five miles. Five miles long and two miles wide. Yeah. So it wasn't very big at all. No, and the lower end of that island was a lot of swamp, so that didn't count too much. <laughs> okay. But, but anyhow, the marine I was trying to think of was McCain. He was John McCain's cousin. Oh, okay. And so, uh, anyhow, we spent that night there. But, but about 8 or 9 o'clock that night, we got in there in the dark as it was. 
was right on the equator, by the way. Okay. We were just a few degrees north of the equator. Okay. Every day, the temperature there exceeded 115 degrees. Oh, boy. People think Phoenix is hot. When I came here to Phoenix 42 years ago, bought my home here 42 years ago, everybody, oh, my God, you can't stand the weather in Phoenix. It's so hot. I said, listen, I spent a lot hotter weather than that, and I couldn't get out of it. Right. I spent 26 days in that kind of stuff. In old wool, I heavy went, wool clothes. I went in there where the, when I got wounded on the 26th day, I had the same clothes on I had when I landed. And uh, So, I so went, you, had, you had said earlier, sir, I'm sorry to interrupt, Walter. You had said that uh, they had told you, you know, this is going to take two days. Uh, what Maybe. I read on the internet, they, they figured uh, four days max. And, well, uh, I don't know where all those things come up at because it was two days and maybe three days. Right, right, and, and they, you ended up, uh, it ended up taking two months. No, well, more than that before the, but we turned the Marines got out of there in twenty eight days. Okay, our outfit was relieved in twenty eight days. I believe we were the last ones. We received the least casualties of anybody, and on top of that. We did the really third battalion did the most of any battalion. I mean, the fifth Marines did the most of anything. See, the first division is made up of the first Marine regiment, and the seventh Marine regiment, and the fifth Marine regiment, okay. and then we had attached to eleventh Marines, which was an artillery. Well, to give you know everybody's seen wars and read about wars and seen them on TV. I don't think anybody's seen this one unless they've seen some of the documentaries. Um, one of the stats I had read, and you correct me, please, uh, is that this battle had the highest percentage of casualties of any battle in World War II. Either not only that, but the heaviest battles the Marines ever had, before or after. They've never had another one since, as the, this was the worst one that they took the base. Hmm. I've got a picture of the survivors, and I think it's 83 people out of 250 that are that got out of there without being wounded or killed. Hmm. And that's what I think about the Raiders. It was supposed to be 50 percent, and this was a lot worse than that even. And uh, Anyhow, today, out of that 250 that we landed with there 74 years ago, there are four of us known for sure to be alive. There's myself, there's Bergen yet, still Bergen in Texas. That's practically a household word. I called him last year on his birthday. He's 13, 16 days older than me, and I talked to him here about two months ago. Good. He sounds awfully old. I could get too much out of him. He used to come on the phone with the bang. Uncle David said, how are you, and all that kind of stuff. But uh, uh, now he don't. I talked to a daughter of his. She was 62. He had four daughters, 62, 64, 66, and 68. And I talked to his youngest daughter. She said he was doing fine, but I just didn't think he sounded a bit good to me. Right. Anyhow... There's four of us known for sure to be alive. They've lost a few of the guys and have been able, unable to contact them. They thought they had even lost me because they were trying to find me in Colorado. And uh, I moved to Arizona uh, for 45 years. It'll be, it'll be 30, uh, 36 years. No, more than that, I guess. I mean, 42 years here. Yeah, I've been here 42 years, but the first five years, I had a catch to it after I bought this house of being able to get here because my wife had a heart attack. Okay. And I was five years later getting here permanently. And if I had to bid, I, my whole life would have probably changed too. But that's sorry there. But anyhow, uh, that's all that's left out of uh, 250 of us. For sure. And you're there so far in the in what we're talking about. You've just been there 48 hours, not even, right? On, on Guadalcanal? 
Yeah, well, no, no, Pele Lu, you were telling me. Oh, yeah, well, second night. Second night. Oh, boy, all of a sudden, I don't know, 10 o'clock, I guess, I don't know, I'd passed out. I had very little sleep the first night. Right. And all oh, heck, folks, was I couldn't tell you, couldn't believe what had happened. And the stars, there were star ships, uh, uh, star, they kept shooting the, the uh, flares to light up things. And the Japanese had 14 barges pulled by little tugboats. They were coming in apparently from Babelthrop, which was the long, largest island in the in the group, was Babelthrop. And they were trying to land on us. They had about 100 men on each one. And the Navy interrupted them out there with a lot of small stuff, destroyers being the biggest thing. Oh, man, did they, I heard there was some PTs in there. I never did see any PTs myself. But they were just shooting the living daylights out of them. They sunk think of the rafts, and the Japanese were drowned in the water. The next morning, well, they said nobody got ashore. I found out later it was about 250 of them landed on the 7th Marines on our, right on our starboard, that they landed on the 5th, on the 7th Marines. There was about 250 out, so 1,400 got ashore. But uh, we didn't stay on that side very long. We started working our way around, and uh, oh, it, was, it was a bloody mess, what I mean. There was no doubt about it. I never did find out whether McCain survived that or not. He was a squad leader, a corporal, a squad leader. I remember at the time thinking it was so funny. His father was an admiral in the Navy, and not, right. o- not only his father, but his father's brother was an admiral. That happened to be John's father. And uh, McCain there, he was four, 14 years older than uh, he, he was. Uh, he was my age is what he was. Okay. And John McCain, is, I found out later years when I met John McCain, I met him uh, 30, 34 years ago, and I've known him ever since. I found out when I met him that we got the same birth date. <laughs> He's 14 years younger than me, on August the 29th. So I, last time I saw him, I happened to be in the hospital on Memorial Day two years ago, and the nurse come around picking this up, picking that up. I was supposed to meet him. I wanted to see him at the cemetery, but I wasn't at the cemetery. She saw McCain's in the office, in the building. That word McCain at this VA kind should make some shudder. And she says, I said, but he isn't coming up here. I said, he isn't coming here. And she said, no. I said, would you run down and tell him? I said, you know where he's at? She said, I think I do. I think he's on the floor below us. I said, run down there and tell him to get up here and see. Because a very important person up here wants to see him. <laughs> she says, who? I said, me. <laughs> I got to go check with my nurse. I said, don't bother about that. He'll be here and gone before you get him. Go tell him. I said, if you don't, I had my scooter parked right beside the bed. I started to get out of bed to get on the scooter. I said, I'll go get him. I'll bring him up here. You get your supervisor in here. Let her explain to him why she, why she won't let you t- go uh, uh, do something to your patients, what you do. She took off like a bomb. She <laughs> didn't know what to do, and she come back in less than a minute. Right in there, say, he's right behind me. He's right behind me. <laughs> And here, about 10 feet behind her was his photographer. He was, uh, John was right behind him. John come in, and I said good morning to him. And uh, he made everybody stay outside. His poor Betty had poor buddy bodyguards with him, but they stayed outside. I said, John, would you let the nurses in? I said, they'd like to meet you. They come in, I introduced them to him, and he says, Walt, do you remember the first time you introduced me? I said, I sure do. He says, do you remember what you told me? I said, I sure do. I said, in case any of you want to know what I told John, I said, John, I'd be glad to have you. He called me up wanting to come to a Lions Club. I said, I'd be glad to have you. But I said, no campaigning. <laughs> I said, I don't want to hear a big, long campaign story. I said, uh, I'll tell you what, I'll introduce you. I'll tell everybody that you're running for Congress and that you would like their vote and uh, appreciate it. You can answer any questions anybody's got. 
I'd be glad to have that. It's just about a lot of cash. He said, okay, well, so that's the way the meeting went. After the meeting, him and I sat there about an hour drinking coffee, talking. I found out her birthday is on the same day and so forth. And as a result, uh, he jumped in his, uh, I don't know what the heck they called him. I can't think what that Chevrolet was that they come out with a, about a half of a truck like. And, oh, Suburban. Well, I thought they were called something different than those days. They might have been. I think they were, but that's what he had. He got it, drove off. I got my car, drove off. I said, boy, times have changed. And he laughed. He said, they sure have. And I've known John McCain ever since. And uh, last year for my birthday, I received a very nice letter from him. Congress, I've got it here. Uh, we should be thanking me and uh, congratulations on my 95th birthday last year. Nice. And uh, I'd like to invite you to my party this year. I believe he's up in uh, He's not in Sedona. They keep calling him Sedona. It hates Sedona, but it's near Sedona. Anyhow, that's a, that's a story there. At, uh, I survived Pelly Lou. I got hit. I actually, I should have been killed by the border. There was just a Marine and I. Was, they, laid a, they laid a border behind us. They laid a border to the side of us and one in front of us. I knew good and well where the next one was going. I yelled at the captain. That's the last words I ever said to Ack Ack. I yelled, I said, Ack Ack, we shouldn't be in here. And uh, anyhow, as a result, that border went off. I never found out where it went off. It hit me like somebody took a baseball bat. Just, I was standing up. I was, oh, very close to this breed probably five or six feet. I think it landed between us, I don't know. He got one piece, I got four. It put me flat on the ground, I'll tell you. I got up on my knees, I looked at my chest, and I had three holes in the middle. Let's see, we, you had, uh, the mortar had just went off between you and your Yeah, I'll your tell you what there. was funny about this. That night, next morning, we dropped off there through the night after all the, oh, everything quieted down somewhere around midnight, 1 o'clock. I really just passed out. The next morning, McCain had his arm in kind of a, have to almost show you the way it was, and a mortar had landed in, in between his arm his head and him, and he was right, oh, four or five feet from me, I would have got two, would have got both of us. But it was a nut, it didn't go off. Oh, boy. That's how close to a cane coming. And, and I both probably come to get it. And probably not even, not only us, there was other V-Reads all around us there that night. And, uh, we uh, We got out of there pretty quick that day, and uh, the battle went on. For 26 days, uh, I went in there weighing 150 pounds. And like I say, we didn't take no food. Didn't need them for two days, three days maybe. Uh, water, water was a scarcity. There was a guy in our outfit named Sledge, Eugene B. Sledge, come out of Alabama. Dad was a doctor, I believe it was. Got him into officer's training. And he got in there, he got teamed up with a friend of his, and they decided that uh, the war was going to be over. They wouldn't be able to get, uh, they wouldn't be in it. They wouldn't see any action. And the only way they could get out of that was flunk out, so they flunked out. Hmm. They sent both of them. I don't know who the other one was. I never did meet him. Anyhow, Sledge comes into our outfit. Somebody tack tackles the name on him, Sledgehammer. <laughs> He was anything but a big guy. He was a small guy. I say small, 5'8", five, 5'10", five, maybe at the most. And kind of a spoiled rich kid, I thought. Boy, he turned out to be one of the toughest Marines I've ever seen. I'll tell you, he did. 
And the NFL, the very first night there, he I think it was the first night, might have been the second, no, it was the second night. No, it was later. There was a hole there. There was some water in it from rain. That's the only rain water you got on that island. There was no water on the island. Hmm. It was, boy, water was so scarce. I wondered a time or two if I was going to die of dehydration. Ooh. So the hot temperatures. I w- sure. I j- just couldn't stand it. You went in at 150 pounds. What did you come out? I come out, I weighed 132. Hmm. First done as a board ship. But in a hell, that night, Sledgehammer got a helmet full of that water and he brought it over to me. He said, Doc, you think this is good to drink? He says, You know, it's dirty. He said, it smells kind of funny, but he says, it's wet. I said, I wouldn't drink that stuff, Sledgehammer. I said, it's be badly contaminated. Oh, he said, I'm really thirsty. I said, well, I said, there's probably going to hope they get some water in here pretty quick. I sure hope so. I need it, too. So he threw the water out. He put in his book. He put that piece, but he didn't put the rest of it. He says, he said to me, he said, if I remember right, I saw that same Corbin drinking that water that night. <laughs> I said, you sure did. I said, I decided I was like you. I'd rather take a chance on getting sick than dying of dehydration. He said, I'm sure you know what they found in the bottom of that hole. I said, oh, yes. I said, I know what they found in the bottom of it. I said, I know well what they found in the bottom of it. He said, don't bother you done? I said, no. I said, I'm alive. What they found in the bottom of it was two dead Japanese. So don't let anybody ever kid you that uh, contaminated water is going to kill you. It sure didn't kill me. didn't bother me a bit. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't do drink if I'd have known it. I wouldn't have drank it. But when you think your life might be in danger, you'll do about anything keep it going. Yes, sir. I'm a, I'm a mighty tough person, I'll tell you that. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Did you, uh, so you're wounded there. Did you continue to stay in the battle? For oh, di- no, no. no the, the oh, after I said, well, I got wounded. I couldn't, I, I was in no condition. Okay, to that's what I thought. I just wanted to make yeah. sure. Well, the morning I got wounded, they laid that mortar in there. It should have killed Mason and I both. There was only one officer, there was only one person left in that gun emplacement. I had yelled, I, I didn't realize. I, I was up against this wall. I knew it wasn't safe. I knew good and well it wasn't safe. But I didn't think there was one going to land right practically on me. I yelled at Akak, Akak, we shouldn't be here. I didn't realize it. We had one officer left, Hillbilly Jones. He was our executive officer, first lieutenant. He was a Mustang. Hillbilly was a Mustang. And he come running over to me, and he said, Hey, Doc, take care of your leg. Take care of your leg. I said, It ain't my leg, Hillbilly. It's my chest. He said, Give me a bandage for Mason. Well, how bad's Mason? I said, He ain't. I don't think he's bad. He was screaming and yelling. He was 17 years old, scared to death. And I said, He said, Let me uh, let me get a, give me a badge. I give him a badge for Mason. He said, take care of your leg there. I said, My chest. Blood was running out of my chest. He was about half ways behind me. He couldn't see my chest. I had three holes in that old jacket. Blood running out of all of them. I opened up that jacket. And that old green marine t-shirt I had on only had one hole in it. How in the heck that happened? <laughs> that jacket had a pleat in it like this. It went right through it and made three holes. Oh, okay. Anyhow, I started to feel around the back where it came out. It didn't come out the back, so I knew I still had them. So I got up on my knees, and that's when Hillbilly got to me. And uh, I looked down at my leg. Finally, good God, I had two holes in the left left side of my thigh. I didn't know about the knee. I didn't know about that till that night. I had two pieces of water shell in the back of my knee. I still got them. Hmm. Anyhow, one went clear through my leg. And he said, I'm going to get a stretcher for Mason. He said, He's not able to walk. I said, well, he's able to, but he don't. he's just not doing it. I said, I don't want no stretcher. You get off the stretcher, what they do is shoot the stretcher bearers, then they shoot the core and shoot the person on the stretcher. Mm. And I wasn't taking any chances as long as I could get on my feet. I got on my feet, and he said, we can go out of this gate. 
we go out of this opening, he said, I'm going to blast He said, Doc, I'll tell you right now, that guy's going to be sorry. I'm going to get him for what he did to you. I don't jump on that tank, Hillbilly. You're a dead target. Don't jump on a tank. I'll get that guy. I'll get him. He ran over there. I went left. He went straight. I did look back at him. He got knocked off the tank. He had to up, stand it up, hold his left side. That's the last time I ever saw Hillbilly. I got down about, I went about a half, three quarters of a mile. I don't know how far I went. It felt like two or three miles from was that park. It was uh, toward the beach. I found a battalion aid station. I got in there. I went in, to, it was busier than heck. A couple of corpsmen and one doctor. I signed myself in, did a corpsman come up? Oh, we got another corpsman. I said, yep. You're second class. I yep, same as I am. I run this place, he said. I said, well, you got a cot I can lay on? He said, yeah, there's two of them back there. Go back and pick one out and let me go get the doctor. So the doctor came back, looked at me, he said, how you feel? I said, I uh, feel pretty good. You, know, you want some morphine? I said, no, I've taken two shots myself. I took one before I started, one about halfway down. He looked at the baddies, and baddies aren't very neat looking for a corpus. I said, well, I put them all while I was on the run. He kind of laughed, and he left. Corbin come and changed the badges. So everything looked pretty good. I felt I didn't feel bad at all, really. And I laid there about an hour, and I said, uh, did, I said, what, what's the doctor say? He said, I, I haven't talked to him at all. He said, he's been kind of busy over there. He said, I'll see what he says. And he come back, and he said, the doctor said to tell you, you're just waiting as soon as he can get the damn track, you're going, about, going to put you on a hospital ship. He don't want to put you on another ship. Once you're on the hospital ship, he said, Go, got one out there, I want to get you on it. I said, okay. I said, by the way, how about Hillville, Hillbilly Jones? He said, was this guy a first lieutenant, a lieutenant? I said, yeah, he's first lieutenant. He said, well, unfortunately, he won't be coming in. I said, he I said, I know he got hit, I saw him get knocked off. He said, well, that's what the report we got was. He got hit twice, once knocked him off, second shot guy right through the heart. Oh, boy. Well, as a result, Hillbilly was the only one that knew what happened to Joe Milton, to Mason and I. He was the only one. So they listed when they called my mother. They didn't call. They said telegrams in those days. When she got a telegram, they reported me missing in action. Uh-oh. And of course, that scared the devil out of him. About two next day, I think it was, that uh, when they saw that I was evacuated, that they knew what happened to me. She got to notice it. I was uh, in a hospital in the South Pacific. Uh, no, no, con no word on my condition, but I was in a hospital in the South Pacific. I was on that hospital ship five days to Manus in the Admiralties. After five days there, one morning, early in the morning. No, it wasn't five days either. Three days there. Three days, I guess it was there. We were three days making that trip. No, it was more that was four days, I guess. I'm not real sure about the days. Sure. Anyhow, we ran us out at four o'clock in the morning, load us on an old D C three. We took off. Well all the breeds were going to Melbourne, Australia, the navy was going to Guadalcanal. And I thought I was going to Melbourne with the Marines. And uh, got about an hour out, I guess. I said there was two two medics on there. I said, I was stretched, you know, strapped in the stretcher. I couldn't see much of anything. I was in the top. We was five deep, five deep stretcher there. Oh, well, boy, that thing was greatly overloaded. I says to this medic, I said, how long does it take to get to Melbourne? He said, yeah, I don't have no idea. I said, well, how are you doing all this? I know I've been running about two weeks every other day. I make a trip here every other day. I said, Where in the heck are we going? He said, Guadalcanal. He said, you're Davy. I said, well, yeah, I'm Davy. I've been with the Marines. I said, for the last, uh, what that time? I don't know. It's oh, two years, over two years. And he says, uh, well, let me go talk to the, to the nurse. I had one nurse on there. She's busier than the devil. I never did talk to her. He went and came back. He says, she says, your, your days of the Marines are probably over. You'll probably go home. Well, can now go to the States and be discharged? I said, oh, I don't think that. I'm not that bad. 
I said, I've experienced stuff. Could he go back now? He kind of laughed. He said, well, you're not going to get back now. Well, that was a long, long trip to the canal. Got down there, as soon as I got in there, the, the Bob 8, Bob 8 Hospital. And uh, uh, a mobile operating base. I said, uh, I, was, I didn't have nothing to say. The x-ray me and everything. I didn't find out nothing the next morning. Here come this doctor. He was this Dr. Mead. He was a reserve lieutenant commander that came from Mayo Clinic. Come in with two x-rays. He showed me where the borders were. What had hit my chest was one piece. I made one hole. When it hit a rib, a last rib, did hit it direct, hit the very edge of it. Instead of breaking the rib, it broke the mortar shell. <laughs> There's a little piece about the size of the, the, the so it looked to him like about the end of my little finger. Quite shallow, looks to be about an inch deep at the most. And then the big piece went about halfway through me. It's about the size of my thumb, first joint of my thumb. It went about halfway through me. And uh, down is the diaphragm, he said. And then he said, uh, two at the back of the left knee. And he says, uh, you know what I would do if I was you? He said, you, I said, sure, I know what you're going to tell me, I think. He, well, he said, you've had these for 11 days. This is 11 days. He said, you notice every time a doctor sees you, the first thing he asks you is how you feel. I said, oh, that's right. He said, well, he said, we didn't know where that went. Had no idea what the size of it was. But he says it's uh, certainly not going to get to your bloodstream. He says you've had that for 11 days as a souvenir. He said, why don't you keep it another 50 years? <laughs> I said, it sounds good to me. <laughs> and that was 70, from me 74 years of the uh, uh, 10th of uh, October this year that I've had that. And I've still got it. That's my souvenir. Hmm. Wow. Um Incredible. Uh, when you, one, you have an incredible memory. Um, it, I, it's just as if it happened yesterday. That's my next question. And I, if this is too personal, you tell me. Um, when you recount these stories and when you tell them your memory is so vivid, are you seeing this in, in, in your head? I certainly do. Yes, I'll tell you, talking about this, it, uh, I was 50 years. I got out of the Navy, went back to work. I only had three jobs in Colorado in a 41-year period. I worked for one guy. I'd known his father. His father was born the day before my 25th birthday. I worked for him. He came to see me last year. I hadn't seen him about 15 years. Brought his son. I hadn't seen his son. His son was three and a half years old. He was 40 years old on the 5th of, the 5th of July this year. Uh, he didn't remember me, but uh, he uh, came. And I, I showed this tape, not a tape, it's a DVD, The Death Bridges of Pelly Lou. Jim says, all these years, I've known you in all walks of life as a little kid, as a teenager. Spent a week in Mexico with him one time. Uh, well, his dad was a competitor of mine. His dad turned it over to him. He later became a competitor of mine. When I left that company after 27 years, I guess it was at that time, you know, I, I, when I left it, they sold out to him. So he owned the business. I went back. My wife had a heart attack. A couple of weeks back, he called me up. Well, he said, uh, right away, what the hell my wife was and everything. I told him, doing good. Could I, uh, are you doing anything? I said, no. He said, could I get you to take my truck to Glen Haven this afternoon? Two guys with, got a, got a baby grand. He said, they don't know how to handle it. He said, I know you do. And besides that, I don't want to trust them driving the truck down there. He said, they're not experienced enough. I said, sure, Jim, I'll do it. I got back. How would you like to work part-time? I know if I did as a result. And he said, after all those years, I worked for you for five years. No, four years, I guess it was, before I come back down here. 
He said, all those years, he says that I did not know that what you had been through. And I said, There's, I just never did say nothing about it. I was uh, making a delivery to a candy shop, chappy shop one day. The guy was all in a big hurry to leave. And I said, what's, what's the rush, Lowell? He said, oh, I said, we got a, we got a Marine Corps general, four-star general of the Marine Corps, coming to see, speak to us at noon. I said, my God, I says, there's only two four-star generals. I said, without a doubt, I know who it is. I said, there's only two. One's the Commandant, the Assistant Commandant. I says, I know it is the Commandant, I'm sure. He said, well, let me see what his name is. I said, see if it is Walt. Well, he said, I don't know. He said, yeah, he said, David Lou Walt. I said, yep. I said, Silent Lou. I said, good gosh. I said, he used to be my battalion. He said, oh, my gosh, why don't you come with me to Rotary? You want to change clothes? I said, yeah. I changed clothes. I went down there with him. I wasn't too popular. That Rotary is a knife and fork club. They're a good outfit. I won't say they aren't. The largest service club in the United States in hell. But he says, but uh, they, uh, they, they, don't, they don't work for their money. If they want anybody to, they do a lot of things. They just pass the plate around. Everybody throws $10, 15 20 $100 in it. That's it. So I went down there, there was three guys, and some one guy went to college with him, he didn't know him. And another guy was over the second battalion, he didn't know him. He got to be this president of the river, he says, I want to introduce you. I said, well, I don't really need no introduction. I said, I know the general well. I don't know him as a general. I said, I know him as a lieutenant colonel. He looked at me, he said, do I know you? I said, you sure do. And it was funny about him. He, uh, I had met him. I was out moseying around the island one day, and I saw his tent. I went over and saw him. I sat under a coconut tree. I two hours to get in to go in. I told him I knew his brother. He wasn't for real. We looked about talking. He found out I was with the Raiders. He was an old Raider himself. I knew that. So we had a quite a little chat, and later he went. I found out he went and talked to my captain, and he told my captain to come. He said he was a clown, really and truly. He loved to tell stories. <laughs> he went to my captain and he told him. He said, "I checked up on that corpsman of yours." He said, "You know, he just come walking into my tent and says, hi, General. How you? I mean, hi, Colonel. How you doing?'" He says, I don't have anybody do that to me. He says, <laughs> he says I, I found out he knew a brother of mine. He said, that guy was with the Raiders. He said he trained with the 5th Marine Raiders before they broke him up. And uh, my captain didn't know that either. But, <laughs> but to one day, I was out moseying around. poo poo I was about a half a mile from where my tent I saw about 20 guys in a circle. Why, what the heck are they doing? There was a gunnery sergeant in the middle of it to give him some kind of instructions. I stopped and watched. About time I come up on one side, won't come up on the other side. He come over to me. I looked and saw what they were doing. They were field stripping a 45, and that's what they were doing. And the, he come over to me and he said, Doug, get in there with them. I said, oh, I said, I don't have a 45. Go get it, go get it. I said, it's a half a mile away. Go get your 45. I want to see you in there with them. I said, those guys will beat the heck out of me. And I do. He kind of made, he, he looked kind of funny. Got a half of a smirk on his face. He says, he hollered at that gunner. He said, Gunny, he said, go get this corner of 45. He's going to join you. <laughs> I said, I don't enjoy those guys. Get in there. So I got in there with them. Three times in a row, I beat them. <laughs> I come out first. First one to get the field de 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 detail strip. One of the field strip and detail strip. Three times in a row. He says, uh, so anyhow, oh, it, in the meantime, when he was going to get that 45, the Walt says to me, I won't let them guys rise you. He said, I won't let them guys kid you how they beat you. He said, I won't let them be, do that. He says, if they 
did they rip you? He says, you just tell me. I says, okay, I will. I said, what makes you so sure they're going to beat me? He just kind of laughed. And he had checked my records and knew I was with the Raiders. That's the only thing I, only thing that I went and had weapon I thought had anything to do with with the Raiders was a 45. He had a pretty good idea of what was going to happen. Anyhow, every time he'd see that Marines, he would say, you're a sorry looking bunch of Marines. These were all, by the way, they're privates of PFCs. I, right. I wasn't up against any seasoned Marines. I was up against a bunch of rookies, but since I was a rookie corpsman too. And he says, uh, he said, uh, Every time he'd see them guys, he'd say, you're a sorry-looking bunch of Marines. You let a Corbin beat you. <laughs> and uh, so anyhow, that, uh, there's that uh, meeting, at the Rotary meeting, he, he uh, well, well, first when he says, uh, do I know you? And I said, yeah, you sure do. He said, when did you first meet me? I said, I met you. I just, just sat under a palm tree. I said, a coconut tree. I said, about two hours wait to see you. And he says, so when was the last time? I said, the last time you saw me was October the 9th, 1944. I said, you come up to talk to Ack Ack, and I saw you at that time. I said, uh, I just uh, barely acknowledged I saw you, and that was all. I said, you were busy with Ack Ack. And he says, uh, uh, I says, up in the Five Sisters area. Boy, about that time, he whopped me one on the back with one head. He was shaking my head with the other one. He said, he's addressing these these uh, Rotarians. Oh, you got to look out for this Corbin. He said, he gave my Marines a terrible time. <laughs> Just a terrible time. That guy didn't know what the devil to think. He was shaking my head with one hand, hit me on the back with the other one. He said, he just uh, give my Marines a terrible time. I said, I didn't give your Marines a terrible time you did. He said, well, it was your fault. <laughs> and uh, so anyhow, he sat there and talked to me about 15 minutes while the Marines had to listen. And they, they weren't very excited because he only spent about another 15 talking to them, come over and said to me the very best to you, and he left, and that's the last time I ever saw him. He, hmm. he passed away uh, somewhere at the age of 69, I think it was. He was a four-star general. Wow. And But I never... I never said a word about anything. I was away from it until 1993. I happened to be at a restaurant and it was above the cafeteria and my wife and I. And here was a guy I looked up in front of me. He had his cap or his covers actually on backwards and he had a first division patch on it. And I said, good God, there's a guy for the first division. I said to my wife, when he gets parked, I'm going to go talk to him. Had a little black girl in his arms. He carried a little girl about two years old. He got set. I went over to talk to him. I said, uh, first division? He said, yeah. And I said, uh, something's it also. I said, oh, God. I said, so I was uh, out of the brink. I said, I was out of the first division, I said, before you were born. And he said, boy, he said, I just... He said, "Do you belong to the first? You, you don't belong to the first division of association." I said, "No." Well, he said, "I've only been to one meeting," but he says, uh, "I'm going to call him. How is I can join him?" I said, "Oh, I don't know. I don't care." He said, "Okay. Well, good God!" He called the president. He called the secretary, the treasurer. The secretary sent me an application to fill out, and I did. I turned it in. And they had a meeting real quick. I missed it. I was, second meeting, I made it. I got there. He was the only one there. He was, good God, the electing president. That, <laughs> that meeting had met in, had met in, they had, there was about two guys that kept that alive for 25 years. Right. And he had a whole bunch of us, 13 or 14 of us there that day. And uh, anyhow, he had a bunch of stuff he wanted to put at each plate was all around the table. He said, hey, Doc, would you put that around there? And I said, sure. And I got about halfway around. I good God, nobody's called me Doc for years and years. And uh, so he introduced me to the to everybody. And he didn't know most of himself. So 
in the hell I've been in the first Marine Division ever since. Hmm. And I had an unusual thing about happening. I, I blogged international. You got to blog the international before you can blog local. And uh, I still blogged it. I blogged the one here. But uh, about three years ago, I was got a phone call from Lions. That was when they called me and uh, wanted to interview me for, uh, uh, well, the, 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 just wanted to interview me. I guess it was, it was a documentary, a history yeah, channel, yeah. or no? It was uh, it was uh, American Heroes Channel. Oh, American Heroes. Okay. And uh, I'd been watching that. I never thought anything about ever being on it, and that's what it was for. Well, anyhow, I was so excited that day. We had a meeting a couple of days later. This guy was picking me up, the president. I was vice president of that organization for 12 years. But when the, the president up and quit off spur of the moment, he was a combat marine, was only about three combat marines in the whole outfit. All the rest of them were 90 day wonders, stateside warriors. As, <laughs> As uh, the guy that filled me for it said, called them stateside warriors. But anyhow, he uh, turned over to me. I solved the problem of a hurry. I was vice president. I said I was going to, for, for about five years, he lived in Fountain Hills. He would come in here, and uh, and I'd take him over. I said, what the heck? I'm, go I'm going regardless. Go with me. You don't need to drive 40 miles. I, I drive about 30. So anyhow, no, he was 50 miles, I guess, away. Anyhow, then as my vision got bad, he started driving about half the time. When I was 90, I could no longer be able to drive. I could not renew my license. Right. I had driven 74 years. So first he used to come, oh yeah, then he'd come here and pick me up. That day he came, I was so excited about that. I started telling him and he said, all he kept saying was, I can't believe they picked a Corvette that's never Marine. I can't <laughs> believe they didn't pick a Marine. I said, I'm the first one from Arizona that they picked for that. And I'm also the first corpsman they've also interviewed, uh, uh, featured in it. And he, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. <laughs> Do you know that with that meeting I wanted to tell about it? He said, well, not now. Not now, Doc. Not now. And he, he wouldn't even take me home. He had one of the other guys bring me home. That guy just got so mad over that, I could not believe why. And he was in the Marines two years, peacetime Marines, as, a, oh boy. as the man that filmed me for that show called them uh, uh, stateside warriors is what he called them. Right. And he says, uh, they don't, all when they see a corpsman, all they think of is, Oh my God! I'm going to get out of the shot in the arm or shot in the high end or something. Right. They don't even know what corps would do. And uh, see, there's unless you're a combat marine, a combat corpsman, uh, the marines, if they're usually around the navy base, they go to navy uh, battalion aid stations, navy hospitals, whatever they have to do. Right. They don't have no contact with them. So how long were you in the service total? Total three years and three months. Three years and three months. Okay. And I lived uh, as a civil, as a result. I grew up. I actually grew up in the service, really and truly. Sure. I tell you, I went in there at the age of twenty, going on about fifteen, and you you grew up fast. I think personally, my opinion is everybody eighteen years and old over should serve two years of service. Makes sense to Th me. Then they should be able to get four years of college. That's what I think would should happen. That would seem to make a lot of sense, wouldn't it? And it a lot of other countries do it that way. They require two that, years of service. I know a lot of countries do. Uh, but they don't hear as a result. And, of course, on top of that, even in World War II, a lot of guys got out of it. A lot of guys ducked out. They, they claimed to be the only survivor and all that kind of stuff. I had nobody. I had nobody at all take care of my mother or look out for my mother except me. I sent money home to her. I, I even ended up buying her house. I bought her a house. I started in 1940. I got it paid for. Uh, oh, let's see. 
40, I think, um, shortly after I got the service. I had, when I went to the service, I got $21 a month. $21 a month is what I got as an apprentice even. Right. And uh, I ended up getting 96 I think that today, if I were to repeat, I was an E5, uh, is what I was. If I would retire today at that, I think it's close to $2,000 a year. Gotcha. It's what I would be getting wages. I wouldn't have got that much retirement, but I think I got two thirds of it, or three fourths of it, or something like that. So does, I mean, that gentleman spoke to you, um, and that brought these stories back up. Does it bother you to tell these stories at all? No, I, uh, no, I have, I have Asiatic attacks. I've had them ever since I got out. I have no worse talking about this than I do otherwise. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate you talking to me today, for and, sure. And Asiatic attacks, they had no Asiatic attacks in World War II, so we get paid. Well, I finally got 30% disability. The Vietnam veterans, they get 100%. Uh, but uh, I had a psychologist, a psych uh, yeah, a psych psychologist at the hospital tell me that, uh, uh, that the reasons that they... The Vietnam veterans get, they were mostly, all, not all, but most of them were drafted. He says, you enlisted. You don't deserve nothing. Oh, boy. And that's, uh, that's just about it, the way they feel. Mm -hmm. Today, I'm confined to a scooter. I can't walk. My vision's bad. My hearing's bad. And uh, my knees are bad. And yet, I'm only 80% disabled. I'm not completely disabled. That's... Uh, you take a guy from Vietnam, he's having bad Asiatic attacks or post-traumatic syndrome, as they call it, he gets 100%. Hmm. He's out here, he looks he looks fine. Not that he don't deserve it. I'm not sure. saying he don't deserve it. He does. But I think I do, too. But I don't get it. Absolutely. Do you have a caseworker or does your social worker work on your behalf for that? Well, yeah, but uh, they can't do nothing either because they don't have... They didn't. They didn't have Asiatic attacks in World War II. Right. No, I understand what you're saying. So, so my my, uh, if I share a little of my dad's story with you. Thank you. Um, he he joined the Navy. Uh, he he grew up in Tennessee in the West Virginia area in, in Tennessee and was a sharecropper. Uh, the war broke out. He he joined the Navy. Uh, went through basic training and he had some uh, bad teeth. And um, he'd always told me stories about the Navy, um, uh, you know, that he'd learned to make flotation devices out of his pants and, and, and some funny stories about some of the other guys he knew in the Navy. But uh, only about 10 years before his death did he share, he, he, he kind of made a statement and said that uh, bad teeth saved his life. And uh, we're all, okay, Dad, uh, what's that mean? And he said, well, I had some bad teeth, and when I finished basic, they held me over and took care of those teeth and sent the rest of my group off, and that ship was torpedoed, sunk, and everyone died. Hmm. Um, and I don't know if he ever, he never expressed guilt or, or anything, but I'm sure there was some, some, uh, some thoughts there, but uh, it's always interesting to to hear stories and, and and i i i relish them because i didn't find out my dad's stories till late and then when i was taking care of him as a caregiver i sat in the va and hospitals and i uh, sat next to a gentleman that was a navigator and he ended up flying a plane home uh, and told me the whole story after both the pilot and, and co-pilot were, were hit uh, next to another gentleman who was going to the front line and the Marines uh, had appendicitis and basic uh, found out he could type and that he could do he was good had a good aptitude uh, so they put him in the office and then while he was in that office recovering he ended up uh, taking some aptitude tests and he ended up being a uh, uh, he ended up being a, a navigator and traveling the world rather than going to the front line so it's always uh, small miracles that kind of put you in places that you that you are and and kind of get you through things and the, all these stories I, I just relish them and, and can't wait to hear them I got got another story here to tell you want me to put this on the air 
That's kind of interesting. Okay. Took, took, yeah. Took all those years. I'll tell you, though, so, to when I got discharged from when I went the first grade that I got acknowledged for what I could do. I mm. was pretty proud of that. You should be, sir. You should be very proud, and, and I'm proud of you, and, and having just met you, and thank you for your service, obviously, and thank you for allowing me into your home. And Oh, you're welcome here anytime. And whatever our, what are our dog's name again? Elmo and uh, what's the other dog's name? Ellie. Ellie. Where Elmo and go? Ellie. Oh, they're... They're up here sleeping. Are they? Yeah, they've they, been coming they, over and giving me little nips, and uh, I've been petting them though. They sure they run out of time, I guess. They yeah, run out of bark. Yeah, time to sleep, I guess. Yeah. So I should probably get going as well. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and shake your hand, sir, and, and and say thank you. My hands out right here in front of you. I know you have a hard time seeing. You bet. And and thank you again. I appreciate it. Thanks, Walter.